chapter 28. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and directed him. You must not take a wife from the Canaanite women. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take as your wife from there one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram, to Laban, the son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he directed him, you must not take a wife from the Canaanite women, and that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Paddan Aram. So when Esau saw that the Canaanite women did not please Isaac, his father, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife, besides the wives he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Chapter 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. 
Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. 
When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Chapter 4 When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Chapter 27 And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. 
There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete, off Salmone. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they had planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land.
The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hold on. I'll be right in there. Hold on. Hold on. I have a new, we're doing something new technically. I'm here. I'm here. Hold on. Hold on. Don't go away. Don't go anywhere, anybody. Here we go. Here we go. And I got to pull this off. <laughs> All right. That's, I think, going to be a new procedure. I don't need to explain it right now. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you see me? No hat today. Got the hair hanging down. Invisible mic. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for bringing us all together here. I know mom is going to be watching this. Uh, I pray that you be with Aunt Cheryl. Just give her peace. I thank you for my mom's comforting voice to her that she has, that Aunt Cheryl has her sister with her. Um, I pray for all the needs of this group. Lord, may you satisfy the desires of our hearts, but most importantly, may you be Lord in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Hello. Well, thank you, Chloe. Mm, I feel it. I do feel it. And uh, man, I got some updates, but uh, let me do the update first. Gosh, I don't know what to say. All right. Something very, very strange happened on Saturday. And I'll give, I need you guys to pray for me. It was Friday and Saturday. So I've been, I finally, I think I mentioned to you guys Friday morning that I had scheduled a meeting with Der Schnork. I think I, I think I updated you guys on all this. I can't go back and watch it to re refresh my memory. But Der Schnork, the the arch priest at the Saint Peter Saint Peter's Armenian Apostolic Church in Van Nuys, California. <clears throat> so I met with him on Friday, and let's just say, uh, seemed providential. <laughs> His yeah. response, etc. I, I can't go good. Okay, I did. Thanks, Carrie. I, I can't go into the details because it would take the next two hours. But it was. It was everything that I hoped it we hoped and prayed it would be, and uh, so then the next day, I've decided to do a text update once a week to the twelve guys that came to the meeting. Right, the twelve that was six Armenians and six non-Armenians, and it just kind of turned out that way. So when I was texting them an update of the week's events, I got a text from Harut the the relative of ararat the relative of doug wilson all right so i got a text from him saying the guy that i had warned him about my hater the, there's <laughs> there's an armenian hater the guy that uh that guy had reached out to him <laughs> had reached out to harut saying that i had told, had communicated with him telling him that harut was going to call him all right, so this, I'm like, wait a minute. I haven't talked to that guy, the hater, in over five years. I had sent an email out to him once I found out he was posting about me again on social media. That's I sent an email to him, got no response. I didn't say give any details. I said, by the way, I'd met a friend of yours or somebody who knows you. I didn't say who it was. So it was very strange uh, that this guy had contacted him. And he was contacting me and I'm like, okay, oh, that's weird. So I was continuing with my update and then I get a phone call from Der Schnork. Like this is a guy I've had trouble getting in to see like for six, seven weeks, finally got a meeting. And now he's calling me less than 24 hours later. And that same guy, the hater had contacted him about me. So it's very, very strange. How does he know? I'm racking my brain. Is there a spy in my group that I that I update? Is there somebody in Armenian that's friends with him? And I know I, I have, you know, it's a small, it's a very, very interconnected community. So somehow he's finding out, he's pursuing, tracking down who I'm talking with and who I'm pursuing. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with people? Uh, and then I thought, well, how, who? And I asked a few of the guys. I went through, through a mental list of all the guys in the group, the 12 that came. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't think it would be any of them. And then I thought maybe he 
track me on my social media on some of my YouTube channels, and I've been updating you guys. So maybe he's watching Bible every morning or This Way Network, and maybe that's where he's getting it. And if he is, well, praise God. <laughs> praise God he's watching Bible every morning. I, I don't know, honestly. Maybe he's going to watch this and, and hear me outing him or telling him about this. It's like, this is crazy, right? And so it's actually a good thing that he's doing this because it's drawing their attention to me, right? This guy hates on anybody that purports to know anything about Operation Nemesis, right? His claim is, my grandfather was the mastermind. And that's pretty well established, right? Like his, there were three masterminds, but his father was the in-country handler for Sogomon in Berlin, right? And so he was the closest to the actions in the operation. So yes, he has a claim to, you know, being the knowing certain information, but there's plenty of information that everybody knows. And that's, and I, okay, I'm taking up too much time with this update, but this guy wants his grandfather to get glory. And the only way his grandfather is going to get glory is if Sogomon Talirian's story is told. And that's what I'm doing. So it's, he's shooting himself in the foot if he thinks by defaming me, he's getting anything done at all. He should be behind my efforts so that his grandfather will finally get the honor and glory and respect due his name. Um, <laughs> and yes, Der exactly. So Derek Schnork already knows and Harut already knows. Thank you, Carrie, for pointing that. I've already met with these guys and they know my sincerity, and you know, et cetera. And so and this guy's just trying to, I think he's trying to be famous and popular and blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know. I don't know. So it's, it's a drama that's unfolding. So Harut has a meeting with the guy on Tuesday. They've actually set up a meeting. And so Harut, I sent him, I sent him the email exchange or something from the email exchange from way back in 2017. When I first met this hater, I forwarded this email to Harut so that he has the background. And if Hater, you're watching this. Be prepared on Tuesday. Like Harut is informed. Anyway. All right. Now to the word of God. I've got three minutes. Let's do this. Uh, in Genesis 28, 15, uh, God says to uh, Isaac, Jacob, no, Jacob, no, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Isaac. It's Jacob. Sorry. Isaac called Jacob. Oh, yeah. To Jacob. Sorry, guys. I'm eating up time figuring out who I'm talking about. I said, I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. And I, I'm going to be kind of break this down kind of literal. I will not leave you, verse 15. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Yeah, Carrie, you're right. <laughs> um, what did he promise? He had just previously in the previous verses promised that you, your descendants will inherit the earth <laughs> the hair, from the east to the west, it's like the dust of the earth. They'll be innumerable. They'll be everywhere. And I will not leave you until that is accomplished. And so he's talking to Jacob. And so, yeah, Jacob has a bunch of children and Jacob sees his children brought into Egypt and pr protected, etc. But this is a promise that extends to the, the ends of the earth and ultimately the end of time of human history right so that that caveat i will not leave you until right it's like oh wait when he finishes the promises when he finishes this promise he'll leave him it's like mm, no it's just a turn of a phrase god will never leave or forsake because this is an eternal promise all right moving on to matthew um the, the story of judas is just so tragic judas it's just this tragic character and it demonstrates the fact that he killed himself before he saw what happened to Jesus. I, I mean, that's the chronology here. And we have no reason to believe that the suicide of Judas happened anytime after uh, Jesus was crucified. It was when Jesus was in prison because he expected Jesus to just throw off, you know, you know, say, forget you guys. I, I have power. Go away. Right. You can't take me. I'm the son of God. Go away. You know, that's what Judas expected. Judas did not expect Jesus to submit to the arrest. And the fact that he killed himself based on that, his expectation was wrong. And he was so self-centered. He didn't even wait to see what happened to Jesus. He was so wrong and, and, and he had no faith. He had no faith. I, I shouldn't say no faith, but he certainly had, didn't have enough faith to at least wait it out for a few days, right? If Judas had just waited three, four, five days, three days. He would have seen the risen Jesus and the risen Jesus would, Jesus would have forgiven him for just three days, all right? Judas 
<laughs> tragic story. All right, we're out of time. What else? For such a time as this, the, the Esther chapter that we just read is one that really rings true to me. I feel like for such a time as this, the Solomon Tolerian story is about to be told. Love you guys. See you tomorrow.